morning, ladies and gentlemen, the excellencies. I'm Sheila Switzer, program chair of the Associates of the American Foreign Service Worldwide, AFSW. Uh, we, are, we are delighted, uh, AFSW, in collaboration with the uh, Washington Educational Cultural Attaché Association, WECAA, welcome you to a wonderful musical program entitled Music and Theater Around the World. As player of growth, music gives us a soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and life to everything. Our presenters for today are Jane Duplain, co-founder of WECAA, and president and CAO of Duplain Global Enterprises Incorporation. Rafael Yabadot, an amazing master violinist, will enlighten us with a beautiful array of music from Asia, Africa, North America, Caribbean, South America, Europe, and the Middle East. And Monia Sagani, a special advisor, WECAA, and deputy uh, communication director for Duplain Global Enterprise and Incorporation. Theater has been presented in various forms and, cultu and cultures in different parts of the world for at least 2,500 years ago. Our theater panelists are uh, Saiku Sisei from Gambia, Mariana Mil Milkeladze from Georgia, John Brammer from Trinidad Tobago, Melissa Gaitan from Honduras, and Hela Sela from Tunisia. Uh, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Jen Duplain. Jen Duplain serves as CAO and President of the Global, uh, Duplain Global Enterprises Incorporation a global public relations and special events company that works primarily in DC diplomatic communities. She is one of the founders of Passport DC and Around the World Embassy Tour, the biggest embassy open house featuring 60 embassies and 50,000 visitors. The program is free and open to the public and celebra celebrated the 16 years last Saturday. Congratulations, Jen. She's also founder of the Embassy Chef Challenge, for which she won an Emmy as a producer and co-founded co International, an embassy global marketplace on behalf of the World Trade Center DC. She recently, she co-founded Washington Educational and Cultural Attaché Association, a membership organization. She has received numerous awards for, many, for her many accomplishments, including the Krug Award, the highest honor of the National Press Club for her lifetime service and a major's proclamation naming January 1 as Jen Plain Day in honor of her life work in DC. Please join me to welcome our beautiful Jen Duplain. Thank you, thank you. Welcome, 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 everybody. It's so great to see all of you. Thank you for coming for today. It really is special. Uh, this is a world premiere, and it's dedicated to Sheila Switzer and the AAFSW, and in collaboration with the Washington Educational and Cultural Attaché Association. So uh, with that, I want to acknowledge the ambassadors that are here, uh, your excellencies. And I, of course, we particularly see our women ambassadors here. You know, I, I talk a lot about, we now have 46 women ambassadors and they just keep coming. So I'm sure there'll be enough men, I'm sure there'll be enough men to go around, but it is sort of a special time in Washington with, with women leadership. I am delighted to introduce uh, your the, the performance today, which is going to be with Rafael Javado. Rafael and I have been together for 15 years, and I feel so fortunate that he came into my life because he has brought music and love and happiness everywhere, and he's been in all of my programs, anything that I do. We're, wave your hand if any of you went to Passport DC around the world embassy tour. Yes, 50,000 came out this time, it was the biggest we've ever had, and over 60 embassies, and of course, Tunisia being one of them, but it was an extraordinary turnout, and I feel very fortunate that I, I was part of that 16 years ago when it began, and I was reminded by the woman who really helped me launch it with me. 
she said, I, we didn't know if the embassies would open their doors because to open it to the public, who, who knows who's gonna be coming in, right? But the embassies did and they loved it because it brought in the, pub, the residents of Washington and also um, visitors from around the world. So it opened up a whole new world for people to have an opportunity face to face to interact with each other at, at an embassy itself. And so I mention that because Raphael has always been part of performing, whether it's with Passport, we'll assign him somewhere, or the Cherry Blossom Festival. Uh, we have this big uh, uh, embassy day, and he performs at that as well. So let me just give a brief background on him. He is, uh, I refer to him as my world-renowned violinist, performer, sol soloist, composer, and arranger. You ready? His musical education began at five. Isn't that true? With, when you read about Mozart or any of the greats, they start very early. So he was five years old, and at the age of 10, he entered a special music school under the Moscow Conservatory. And the Tchaikovsky School is considered one of the best music schools in the world. After graduating from the conservatory, he played in one of the top Ukrainian symphonies for several years and served as the concert, ma concert master of the North Pole Navy Band in Russia. After his triumph performances through Russia, Ukraine, and Europe, the ensemble was offered a tour in the United States. And to our good fortune, Mr. Javado has been residing in the USA since 1993. He performs as an orchestra player with many of the USA symphony orchestras. He plays at diplomatic and embassy events, cultural events, as well as numerous recitals as a soloist and a member of the chamber music. He's also performed live at the Kennedy Center and he the arrangements he does are from Russian folk themes and romances and the Mediterranean folk music, gypsy, Jewish, American classics, and cla it goes on and on. He is a formidable. So I just want to move uh, forward and say currently he, I know he is on the music department at the Washington Global Public Charter School here in Washington, D.C. And uh, so today, again, I just want to say he's the jewel in the crown for us, for music. He's the best in the business. And what makes today even more exciting, as I said in the beginning, Sheila, he has customized and created this music around the world for Sheila Switzer and AAFSW here at the State Department. You'll notice on stage his art collection. So you can all see that when we, when we are through with the show afterwards because it's his own personal. So with that, and on behalf of the Washington Educational and Cultural Attaché Association, proud to collaborate with AAFSW in presenting <clears throat> the world premiere of Music Around the World. Join me in welcoming the one and only Raphael Javido. Raphael. <laughs> We love you.
gosh whoa Raphael you did it this was it the world premiere Sheila for you and IAFSW here's our flowers anyhow thank you you've been a great audience dancing and all and to I just want to take a moment too and thank those that are here who are very special to us, the wives of the ambassadors. We have the ambassador for Tunisia. Just stand up for one moment so we can acknowledge you. We have the ambassador's wife from Kyrgyzstan. Would you stand, please, you beautiful lady? And we have an actual dancer. She was a professional dancer from Slovakia, right there. The ambassador's wife from Slovakia. She, if you saw her dancing. I understand, is Vietnam, I'm not sure of the, Ivory Coast is the ambassador's wife from the, okay, okay Vietnam, oh, great, wonderful. And Ivory Coast, and, and there's, I probably if we went around, Kenya, is the Kenya here? Kenya, oh, oh yes, 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 sorry, I'm looking right at you. I, I bet if we went around the room, but there are 26 
countries represented. <laughs> See, Sheila, you got me. 27. So that's, all, that's what I love about AAFSW. It's bringing cultures together all over. So we have another, uh, again, Raphael, just thank you again and again for you did a great job. Thank you, my fr beautiful friend. So is Monia Zagarni in the audience still, or has she run off to gather everybody together? Oh, there you are, okay. Monia, will you please come up, my friend? Monia works with me. Uh, she is from Tunisia. She's a lawyer and a brilliant, wonderful, wonderful partner associate with me uh, at our uh, our tiny little boutique operation that does all these different events that I couldn't do without the help of her. So with that, Monia, this, this second part is going to be, uh, as she will explain to you, different cultures from different countries that have come here today. So it's gonna be a shorter, it's gonna be a rather short uh, presentation, but we wanted to get the cultures from different embassies that have been doing things. All of these embassies that are here today were part of Passport DC Around the World Embassy Tour. All of you performed uh, beautifully during that. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Monia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, good morning. No, good afternoon, everyone. Isn't it very nice to move a little bit <laughs> with Raphael? Yeah, that was great. Um, thank you, Sheila, for uh, hosting this event and organizing this event. It's a beautiful event. And uh, thank you, Jean, uh, my amazing uh, boss. <laughs> <laughs> it's my pleasure to host this portion of today's program. We have five wonderful speakers from different uh, parts of the world, uh, which include Eastern Europe, uh, the Caribbean, uh, South America, and Africa. I will briefly introduce each speaker and invite them to come to the microphone and speak for five minutes. At the conclusion of this part of the program, we will, we will have one final musical performance by Raphael Jabadov, and then Sheila will conclude the program. And now I will introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Mr. Seiko Seise, uh, first secretary over overseeing information and cultural affairs at the uh, Embassy of the Gambia in Washington, D.C. He was the spokesperson of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, International Cooperation, and Gambians of the Republic of the Gambia for six years, and was also active in the media as an editor uh, of an independent newspaper representing uh, the Gambia Press Union and worked for different international media outlets too. He holds a master's degree in diplomacy and international relations and degrees in journalism, digital, and digital media from the University of the Gambia. He trained in diplomacy in Japan, Turkey, India, and the, and the People's Republic of China. He's, of course, bilingual and speaks Japanese. I'm always impressed by people who speak Asian languages. <laughs> Please welcome uh, Seiko Sise of the Gambia. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Uh, it's really been great to be here today. And then, but um, without going into my uh, presentation proper, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, Sailor Witzer, Sailor Switzer, the chair of the program. I would like to acknowledge you. And then I would also like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Madame Jean Duplain the CEO and uh, president of Duplain Enterprises. I would also like to acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, um, Monia uh, Ghani. She is the deputy to um, Madame Jean Duplain, ambassador of Tunis here present, um, all other ambassadors and wives of ambassadors here present, uh, members of the diplomatic community here present. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome to you all. I welcome you all to this um, morning uh, presentation. Um, my presentation will focus on the um, music of the Gambia and theater, the Gambian music and theater. Uh, my presentation will focus on that. But as you may know, 
Gambia is a country in West Africa, and it is purely a traditional country. It's therefore, its music has always been tradition. Gambian music has been tradition, and this dates back as old as the Gambia itself. The, the, there are different ethnic groups. There are different ethnic groups, you know, um, in the Gambia. We have about seven ethnic groups in the Gambia. So each of these ethnic groups have their own music. They have their own sets of musics, and then and there are ways they place their sets of music in line with their respective cultures and traditions. And, and then also, um, if you look into them, you will understand that the Mandinka is a tribe, the Wolof is a tribe, the Fula is an ethnic group, the, the, the Sarahules is also an ethnic group. So each of these groups, as I mentioned, have their own music. So the Mandinka, they have Kora, they play Kora, the Wolof, they play Halem, the Fula, they play Riti. So each have their different sets of music. So, but notwithstanding, this traditional form of music has been going on until in the 1960s. In the 1960s was when Gambian music started transforming. It started being modernized. It started changing. This was with the advent of the guitar and the keyboards, you know, started coming into the Gambian music in the 1960s. So you have the, the, the Gelawa, the Super Eagles. So this set of band, this band, you know, they were playing in the Gambia, very popular, very famous in 1960s, you know. So from, from 1960s downwards, the music in the Gambia started, you know, um, being modernized with the keyboard and other, and also the playing of jitter. So essentially, when you talk about Gambian music, you can talk about the tradition as old as the Gambia itself, as I mentioned earlier. So, and then, as I said, Music is for everyone in the Gambia to enjoy, as around the world. But in my country, it is not the responsibility of everyone to play music. Not everyone is recognized as music players. There are a set of group called the caste system responsible for playing music. These are called the giriots, you know, or in my language, the jalis. So these are the people responsible for playing music. Though everyone enjoys it, and then music is not played for everyone. It's played for um, the, 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 the royals, usually in traditional Gambia, and prominent people. And there are ways and manners in which these musics are also played for these people, and where these musics are also played for these people. Not everywhere. As we speak now, the Gambian music is booming. We have um, international stars, you know, like uh, Jaliba Kuyate, these are international stars. Star. We have also Sona Jobate, she is an international star. She recently appeared on 60 Minutes, and she plays Kora. She is the only female Gambian that plays Kora, in fact, that itself, you know, uh, you know, has never existed in the history of the Gambia. A woman playing kora. She's the first woman to play kora in the Gambia, and she she recently traveled to the U.S. to, you know, attend shows, you know, uh, around the states here. So we also have locally renowned stars who attract, you know, fans of twenty-five thousand locally in the Gambia. Whenever they organize shows, they will attract at least a minimum of 25,000 or so number of fans in their shows. So but the Gambian music, as I said, does not go without challenges. It has its own challenges. Some of the challenges that faces the sector are lack of capacity you know, to, to manage music or musicians. We have good musicians, but, the, but, but we lack the capacity. The managers lack the capacity to manage these musicians. So that's one challenge. Two is infrastructure, recording studios. We lack recording studios, and that is something that affects the growth of media in the Gambia. And then I think um, Sona Jobare, who recently appeared on 60 Minutes, is working on establishing 
a media academy in the Gambia. So this media academy will have a music studio that will do recording, not only for her music, but also music, other musicians too in the Gambia. So um, she's working on that project, and we as an embassy are collaborating with her to support her because it's a huge project. It's a $5 million project that SONA um, is working on establishing. So we want to support her to realize that so that music can continue playing its rightful role in the development of the Gambia. So as I said, infrastructure, distribution is also a problem. Now, artists depends, as I said, artists depends on their, on, on their source, to, to organize source, to organize Suarez, to, you know, get, get, to generate income. They hardly depend on the sale of their albums because there is royalty problems. You know, we, we, have, uh, we have royalty issues with artists, and though we have a royalty collecting society, but it has not been very active. And that really, you know, um, greatly impede the growth of, mus of music and musicians in the Gambia be because their products are being played everywhere, you know, in, in, in taxis, in vehicles, in Ubers, and then also, you know, at schools, at everywhere, without, you know, the artists earning anything from this music. So uh, we have a copyright law. But the copyright law is not very much effective. So the issue of royalty, you know, is an issue. And then I think once we get that, you know, um, running or properly put in place, it will really, you know, operationalize, you know, the royalty collecting of this um, 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 artist. That it will really enable them to collect royalties on time. And I think that is something that affects you know, the growth of uh, Gambian uh, music. Um, um, I would, from there, I would like to move into the theater industry, because we are given limited time. Gambian theater, you know, in, in, traditional, in, traditional, in traditional Gambia, as, as you know, as I mentioned earlier, theater is usually the domain of women in traditional Gambia. Women are the predominant players in theater in the Gambia. They narrate stories, they create humor at social gatherings, which also at naming ceremonies, at circumcision ceremonies, and then also you know, at competitions, like wrestling competitions. Women will be there you know, to play, to showcase their talent, to create humor, you know, to create an environment that will bridge gap or bond between people, between families and within communities. So dancing, singing, and ululations of young girls and women, for example, the, the dancing of young girls and women in competitions like wrestling competition. We in Africa usually organize wrestling competition not because of only fund, but also to serve, you know, to, you know, to serve you know, as a bond, to bridge relations between people between families. And that is why Africa people, it's more, people are very much connected. And then people are most, you know, uh, sociable, people can share, people are closely knitted society. So it's because of that. And also the, at, ne at funerals also, at funeral ceremonies, the women, the, 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 the way in which people mourned, women cried determines the level of um, respect that will be accorded to the deceased in funeral ceremonies. So women you know, decide a lot you know, when it comes to um, um, paying of respect to deceased individuals in traditional Gambia. So this may not obtain now in reality, but this was the history, and this has been the tradition of the Gambia when it's come to theatering. Though we have, we have seen you know, a swift change you know, in, in, in theater in the Gambia. We have Ibujan, we have Ibujan theater. We are working on building um, an academy you know, for theater, though we are yet to have one. But we have an institution where theater is played called Ibujan theater. And 
and now a good number of Gambian youth are into theater and drama, and you can see, you know, they have, we, they, we, they do organize drama groups, you know, but also in the Gambia, one thing also is interesting that will interest you is that each ethnic groups in the Gambia have their own drama groups that sensitizes people on harmful traditional practices in communities or, you know, vices that are not very much welcoming. They work in collaboration with the civic education, you know, to educate the, pop, you know, the, you know, the, the public on, you know, for instance, early child marriage, for instance, polygamy, for instance, drug abuse and so forth and so forth. So these drama groups usually, usually comprise of women, you know, in educating the public about some of these menaces in our society. So, but also, as I said, most of these young people into this profession have not gone to theater schools. They are naturally endowed and they exhibit and apply their skills in educating the public. But they also, there are challenges and then there are also reasons that got them you know, in, in this you know, industry. First, income generation. Second, passion for the industry. Some, they, are, they, are, they have natural passion for the industry, and others are just into it to generate a source of income. It would, these youths would work hard to get recognition in order to make a dignified living out of the industry. Drama, dance, and theater are gaining momentum in the Gambia, and these performances afford the youth and women to exercise cultural rights and expressions. So there are certain cultural rights that we think women you know, should enjoy, like women having land to, access to land, which, 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 which is an, a great issue in my country. So these things will be dramatized to educate the public, to educate political leaders on the need for the rights of women be respected. So, and, and also, uh, but with the advent in 1995, from 1995 to date, the advent of um, TV stations and also the proliferation of media outlets in the Gambia greatly helped um, the education process of the public through theater and drama. So um, I understand that this is around, but uh, yes, regarding education of, in the area of theater, Media outlets, radios, and televisions are used to sensitize the public about the harmful effects of early marriages through drama and theatering, female genital mutilation, circumcision, which really affects you know, you know, the health of women greatly. It's prevalent in a lot of countries around the world. And then drama is being used you know, to eradicate it, to sensitize people on its effect on the growth of girls and then also of all women, and the need for the girl child to be sent to school, because a lot of countries in Africa, girls still, they are sent to school, of course, but not at a proportion at which we would have wanted it. So drama continues to play a crucial role in convincing people, parents, from all corners of the, from, from all corners of villages around Africa to send their kids to school, because we believe it with education, People will be equipped enough to earn a dignified living with education. We will have a more peaceful and a more harmonious world. So women leaders or prominent women who happen to be traditional communicators would most of times be used to communicate specific messages to communities through theater and drama. We have traditional communicators, and these traditional communicators in our communities usually are women. They are women leaders in our communities. So most of the times, these women leaders are traditional communicators. They are giving some vital messages to communicate to the public. And whatever messages they share within the community is usually adhered to, is, or is usually respected and honored by the rest of the community. I, I would like to stop here. And uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I couldn't. Thank you very much, Seiko. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Seiko. That was very interesting. Um, music and theater in the Gambia. Now, oh, our next speaker, uh, Miriam Mikaledze from uh, the cultural attaché at the Embassy of Georgia. 
in DC. She works passionately on deepening cultural ties between Georgia and the US, I agree. <laughs> Prior to DC, Miriam worked at the NATO and uh, the European Union where she managed European Union information campaign in the region of Georgia. And she also worked on news coverage as the third secretary at the press and communications department. She holds a bachelor's and a master's degree from Tbilisi State Academy of Art in Media Art and speaks Georgian, German, and some French. Please welcome Miriam Mikhailidze of Georgia. Uh, Dear distinguished guests, so um, it's my honor and a privilege to welcome you to, um, to um, express my um, um, knowledge about uh, theater and um, music uh, on behalf of the Embassy of Georgia. And before I begin, I'd like to uh, express my uttermost um, gratitude towards Sheila Twitter, uh, Jean Duplan, and um, Monia Zghani. So um, thank you for bringing us together to share our cultures and traditions about theater and music. As we gather here today, I am reminded of uh, the rich and vibrant history of my beloved country, Georgia. Our history dates back to the 6th century BCE, uh, when the first Georgian ancient kingdom of Golgheti was formed, and our natural riches, beautiful landscape, and, uh, and uh, strategic location between Europe and Asia have been uh, attracted to, uh, the attention of great powers uh, over the centuries from many different <laughs> directions, which has at times resulted in difficult and troublesome periods uh, in our history. Yet, despite the challenges we have faced, the adoption of Christianity in the fourth century marked a significant stage of social, political, and cultural development for our country. We have constantly fought for our independence and faith, which has made us stronger and resilient. Um, music and theater have been always been an integral part of Georgia's ancient traditions and constant fight for freedom and independence. Our festivals, such as Berik Auba, Kenoba, have ancient roots, but roots, Berik Auba is a pagan ritual that celebrates fertility and rebirth. Uh, while Kenoba is a ritual for the start of the grape harvesting uh, season and highlighting the importance and love of winemaking wine uh, in Georgia and social life. Uh, these festivals are unique to Georgia and feature traditional elements of our culture, such as music, dance, and of course, wine again. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like to share with you an interesting story for the, uh, from the Georgian history, uh, the Battle of Kutsanisi. During this battle, uh, King, the, King uh, Heraclius of Georgia had, um, placed a troop of actors on the front line, uh, specifically the Royal Palace Theatre, only equipped with the musical instruments. So as the enemy approached uh, from, from the opposite side uh, with their sabers, swords, and uh, daggers, the actors led from this side, uh, um, the actors led Georgian warriors uh, forward uh, to evoke uh, and evoked the emotions, screams, and the will of fight. Um, this is the only instance in the world theater history where an entire theater troupe was um, lost in the Battle of Tzanisi. This event gave significant importance to plays in Georgian theater and cinema that incorporated especially um, written music. Georgian theater has been contributed greatly to our culture, but it is not one, it is not the only part of our vibrant cultural landscape. 
uh, our folk music is equally captivating with its nostalgic melodies and intricate harmonies um, rooted in um, our country's long and storied history. Georgian folk music is a celebration of life, love, and human spirit. One of the most unique aspects of Georgian folk music is the polyphonic singing style, which involves multiple singers harmonizing together in a way that creates a truly unique and unforgettable sound. This style of singing has been recognized be, um, by the UNESCO uh, as a masterpiece of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity. Uh, today we have several popular folk uh, ensembles that we often bring to the United States uh, to share our culture and traditions, including Shvitkatsa, Alilo, and Teatral Quartet, and many more. Uh, as we celebrate our 32nd Independence Day in a few weeks, I'm filled with pride and gratitude uh, for my uh, beloved country, uh, for its beautiful uh, traditions and uh, rich culture. Um, Georgia's wealth lies in people and location. Uh, it's not rich with uh, gold, gold, oil, or <laughs> diamonds. Uh, so we are the cross. We are at the crossroads of the various cultures and a melting pot of history and beacon of resilience. So I'd like to finish my presentation with um, Italian film director Federico Fellini was an admirer of uh, um, the Georgian film. Georgian film is a completely unique phenomenon, vivid, philosophically inspiring, very wise childlike, there is any er, everything that can make me cry, and I ought to say that it, my crying, is not an easy thing. Uh, so once again, I extend my heartfelt uh, thanks to my special friends in Washington, D.C., Sheila, Jeanne, and Monia, uh, and um, thank you again for getting us all together. And um, thank you very much again. And now a short three minute uh, film will be turned on with some bits of uh, Georgian music as well. And uh, subtitles are off. Okay, so um, a little bit of uh, Georgian movies. Thank you, Miriam. Now, our next speaker is uh, Joan Bremer, Public Affairs and Cultural Attaché at the Embassy of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago in DC. She recently was asked to become the first school leader of WICA, the Washington Educational and Cultural Attaché Association, a new nonprofit in DC bringing all the attaché together for common projects. She's passionately work, she passionately works to address issues brought to her by uh, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, living in the United States, and uh, enthusiastically promote her country's culture around the world. She also loves the national instrument, the steel pan, which she has been playing for many years. She's a fierce, fierce advocate for youth, and she, she's active in the DC Embassy Adoption Program. Married for 46 years. Wow, <laughs> you deserve you deserve uh, an award. And uh, she's a mother of two, and she tries to live by her mantra: "Kinds rules the world." Please welcome Joan Brammer of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Of course, I have to specially mention Sheila, Jan, and Monil. I'm Joan Brahma. I'm the public affairs attache from the Embassy of Trinidad and Tobago. So here goes. Every culture is unique, but Trinidad and Tobago is doubly special because of the number of art and cultural traditions that have been preserved and cross-pollinated by generations of migrants from all over the world, 
all in one twin island republic. This makes Trinidad and Tobago a buzz with artistic and cultural music, dance, theater, drama, fashion, literature, and much more. The Little Carib Theater was founded by Beryl McBurney in Port of Spain in Trinidad. She was the pioneer in promoting primitive and Caribbean dance. Her influence continues to be conveyed within the generations of dance and culture even up to today. The National Theatre Arts Company was formed in 2014. Theatre in Trinidad and Tobago is composed of diverse disciplines, including acting, dancing and singing, all of which are incorporated into our indigenous art form, the Best Village Style Theatre. It could not exist without writers, visual artists, technical theater, practitioners, designers of various ilks, and of course, producers. The small size of the local art scene means that many artists are part-time semi-professionals. But there's certainly no shortage of vibrancy or creativity. If you came to Passport DC in, at our embassy, you would have known what I'm saying is true. Artists draw on the classical and folk traditions of Europe, Africa, and India, combining them in original ways or adding a Creole touch to create new forms that are distinctly Trinbigonian. You know, Trinidad and Tobago, we are the most diverse of all the islands. So that's why I said that. When carnival season is over, we can look forward to heading to our sister isle of Tobago, where the Tobago Heritage Festival takes part in mid-July to early August. This festival depicts a visual representation of a reenactment of an 18th century wedding procession through the village streets. Around September, look out for performances of Ram Leela, an epic adaptation of Ramaya, enacted by villages at open air venues, mostly in central Trinidad. Trinidad and Tobago's most popular export, the steel pan, notice my smile, was, was created in Port of Spain in the 1930s. For indigenous Trinbigonian music, Calypso, Soca, and steel pan, the best time is carnival. I'm expecting all of you next year. Please fly in on our national airline, Caribbean Airlines. You get a taste of the warmth of the Caribbean. Let me make another plug. I used to be a flight attendant. <laughs> Beyond our local traditions, there's an increasingly diverse music scene. There's a strong tradition of artists who grow their own world music from distinctly Trinidad roots, local fusion bands like Orange Sky, Sataris Mangal Patisar, and his Indian Creole fusion music, Orisha, Ella and Dell and the Rapso of Three Canal, just to name a few. You can look forward to performances by many of our world-renowned soca artists like Marshall Montano, Kess, Patrice Roberts, and Destro. The impact of theater in Trinidad and Tobago, as I mentioned before, is different to what people typically think of as theater. Here in this beautiful tropical twin island republic, we take it to the streets, in the tongues and in the villages, and we stamp it with our own creativity. From the videos you're about to see, our youth are never left out. We have visual represent representation of K2K, a band that showcases theater on the streets for carnival. And of course, you'll see the Mariah Old Time Wedding on the streets of Tobago and Ramlila celebrations. And this all gives you an insight into the diversity of my beautiful homeland, the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is a. Uh, this is a music a musical video for the Trini yeah, from the Trinidad and Tobago. It's the sound is off. Carlos, can you? 
How would you explain to someone who's never experienced Ram Leela what takes place here? Ram Leela, first of all, Leela means the pastime, the sport in time, the divine actions of Bhagwan Sri Ram himself. And Ram Leela is the reenactment of the lifestyle, the values, and the characteristics that Sri Ram himself, the divine, displayed on earth. So we highlight the scriptural, the spiritual, and also the local concept. It's a blend of a few things put together for Ram Leela. So the captain of the band at the helm, and it is really a play on the wedding. It's a beautiful costume. Brings back fond memories. Oh yes, oh yes, it's always lovely to be a bride. Including the fascinator? <laughs> Including the fascinator. <laughs> What, do you, what goes through your mind when you're about to cross that stage? Oh, it's such a free, liberating feeling. You know, I tell people that we are exhibitionists. At okay, wonderful. Thank you, Joan. Now with our next speaker, uh, Melissa Gaetan, born in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. A mother and a wife and a professional diplomat who began her career as an intern in the embassy of the U.S. in Honduras and um, in public relations, as well as uh, the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. She has a bachelor's in international relations from the Catholic University of uh, Tegucigalpa. She wants to serve people, loves to travel, and is interested in different cultures. When President uh, Xiomara Castro was elected in 2021, she was honored to serve as a minister counselor in the Embassy of Honduras in Washington, D.C. Please welcome Melissa Gaitan of Honduras. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, it's an honor for me to represent the um, Embassy of Honduras. So um, the origin of the theater in Honduras started in the 18th century, a uh, former theater called Pastorelas. Um, intro, um, that it was like for introducing the Christianity in um, in Honduras, and that is the image of the first theater, um, theatrical performance, El Diablo Cojuelo, that it was like an evil spirit and and tried to scare like the people, and and it, it was the uh, Spanish uh, role written by Luis Vélez de Guevara, a uh, Spanish. And then he wrote the play. The next one, yeah. Uh, then the Pastorelas, um, the father, uh, Jose Trinidad Reyes, he created a lot of Pastorelas uh, to, to, inter to introduce the Christianity in Honduras. And he founded the first university of Honduras, the public university. Yes, the next one. And this is the, um, the only public uh, theater that Honduras has. And it was created in 1915. And it was uh, the president decided to create the theater uh, in honor of 300 years of uh, Don Quixote de la Mancha, um, Spanish play. Uh, yes, the next one, please. And some of the Honduran figures that are um, the role, like very important uh, plays, is Ramon Amaya Amador. That he was, he wrote about a lot of critics to um, about what people were going through in uh, the society in Honduras. Uh, also, Rafael Murillo wrote El lado lejano and has been performed over a thousand uh, times worldwide. And Daniela Ines, a Honduran poet, as the, in the same time uh, as the first one, as, um, he wrote about what uh, the Society of Honduras were going through in the 50s. And um, the works of Tito Estrada, director of Memories Theater, are still playing in Honduras. And the next one, please. And those are some plays in uh, famous of Honduras. And the next one, please. As this one, uh, this is the theater La Fragua. It was um, created by um, 
Jack Warner of the Jesuit order. Uh, he's the founder of this theater and his mission is to um, um, educate the people so they can, uh, they know that they can, uh, they can become uh, a, um, better themselves and no matter the circumstances that they are going through in Honduras because there's a lot of necessities in education and not everyone can have access to um, for theater and music. Yes. Next, next one, please. And these are uh, four schools of theater in Honduras and also uh, with the um, Public uh, University of Honduras. In, but, um, yeah. Next one, please. Yeah, okay. So the, um, the history of the music in Honduras started in, in, in 1834 with the military bands, but before the Spanish uh, got to Honduras, they, the indigenous people, they already had their own traditions and music too. Uh, in 1896, the Honduran government brought the, um, Carlos Hartling from Germany to create the national anthem of Honduras. And in 1910, was created the first uh, national school in Tegucigalpa. And then there were created three bands. And of those three bands, only one still exists, the power of the um, power of supreme um, Band. And with uh, um, the reform, the liberal revo reform in the 1910s is what um, helped the people to, to develop a later culture, producing changes and, and cultural expression in the arts of the Honduran people. And there are also two most important uh, um, types of music in the north coast is the punta, that is of the Garifuna people, that they come, they came from Saint Vincent, and they speak Garifuna, and they have their their dance and music punta, that with the drums, and like, um, and they also do the rituals when the singing when someone uh, dies. And also the of the indigenous the folklore music, and and so um, the future of the Honduran musical theater culture, President Xiomara is strong supporter of the fine arts, and the Honduras um, needs support in providing the following theater uh, group programs summer programs for children, because not all the kids go, have the opportunity to go to the schools, and because they, um, there are a lot of necessities in the country. And um, theatrical and musical instruction, and providing instruments, and um, they need to open the, um, Xiomara, the president is working on creating again the symphony because it was closed, because there was no budget on the previous government, but now she's working on it and to buy new instruments and to open the symphony. And yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you, Okay, wonderful. And now we will go to our final speaker, Hela Akrut who came to the United States with her parents from Tunisia at the age of 10. She earned her undergraduate degree from George Mason University and an MBA from George Washington University. She is a successful businesswoman, speaks three languages, and her dream was to start her own business, honoring her family's legacy, uh, and did so by making olive oil. Who doesn't? Uh, I love oil. I lo Someone told me I have olive oil in my DNA. I don't know. <laughs> uh, which her grandparents began. Hela is passionate about culture and art and is the co founder of Shakshuka, a Tunisian nonprofit based in the US whose mission is to promote Tunisian artists and culture in the US. Please welcome Hela Akrut of Tunisia.
Thank you. Shukran. Uh, merci. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Monia. Thank you, Sheila. Shukran. Um, just a, out of curiosity, who has been to Tunisia before? Ooh. One, two, three. Oh, soon. <laughs> She's traveling soon. So, well, I hope you will love it. <laughs> So I, I wanted to give you a little glimpse of Tunisia through its music and, and theater. Um, I don't know if you can get to uh, this, the whole screen. I think, I believe if you do the slideshow here, I think. <laughs> you'll have a bigger screen. But I'll quickly introduce to you, oh, no, I guess not. <laughs> There's a slideshow somewhere. It's okay, but there we go. Okay, we'll just go this way. So we'll start, this is one of, uh, one of uh, Tunisia's most famous uh, uh, village, which is Sidi Bou Said, one of my favorite pictures. That's why I put it up there. And then, so let me introduce you to the music. And so I'll go, I'll go through the, genre, the, the genres, the women, the men, and the venues of, in, in terms of music. So to start with the, the genre, genres, <laughs> I can only say it in French, genre. <laughs> uh, we have Malouf, uh, Malouf, Stambeli, Suleyma, and Mazwood. There's so many more, but these are the most famous and the most known. And, uh, and they're in a chronolo chronological order. Um, so we'll go with the next slide to introduce the Malouf, which is the oldest musical genres. And, and, and it's mentioned in the, um, Andalusian music, it came from the south of Spain uh, during the Islamic Golden Age. The, the John, this type of music brought uh, North Africa, was brought to North Africa by the Arabs and the Andalusian music musicians who migrated in the region in the 13th century. Uh, over time, the Malouf became a, a form of, of music that's, that's very common in, in, uh, in Tunisia. Um, I, I don't know if you can click on the Malouf just to give you an idea of what it sounds like. Now go back to, and you can click on it. And if that doesn't work, I have my plan B. <laughs> Does it work? No, okay, I have plan B. Just to give you an idea of what it sounds like. Okay, this is the Malouf, and then the next one is Tambeli, which or originated from a um, uh, Tunisian's African community, which descended from sub sub Saharan slaves and migrants. And the music has its roots in the Guana uh, uh, music of West Africa, which, brought, which was brought to Tunisia by slaves and migrants in the 17th, 16th and 17th century. Stambeli is characterized by the use of the gambri, which is a uh, three string bass instrument, and is often associated with healing ritual. So it has that sort of a uh, trans, trans uh, power. And let me get that, my plan B, let me see if I can get that. <laughs> very, very trancy. It's, uh, it's unfortunate because the, in the movie you can see, you can see the, the instruments in the movie, um, so if you go back. <laughs> I wanted to show you the instruments that they use, but that's okay. <laughs> we can't get to that. And then in the other, in the other um, video, so this is another, this is still Stambeli with the, 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 the drums. So, but that's not Suleyma. It's, <laughs> it's the one before. <laughs> and then let me see if I can get you, get you the, um, uh, and then I wanted you to hear the, um, there's a, a very recent uh, 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 performer who actually also uses Tambeli in his music, and it's uh, Sabr Erbei. And um, let me see if I can get that to you. If you can click on it, it should work. <laughs> no? <laughs> Uh, 
you probably have heard this, this song before. Let's see. Tell me if you have. This was just to show you that it's still very, very common. This is a very recent uh, uh, artist that plays this song, which is back to, it goes back to, um, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm a little. <laughs> um, Suleiman, then Suleyma. For that, it's a, a, John, a type of music that originated from the city of Sousse, which is more in the south of, uh, so more in the middle of uh, Tunisia, so south of Tunis. And this one uses the, the darbuka, which is very typical of Tunisia. It's a drum, so the small one. This one, it's a, this is a darbuka. Very unique in terms of instruments. Uh, of, uh, it's made out of clay and, uh, and, uh, and uh, skin. And then uh, the, the tabla. The tabla is the big one. And this, this is an artist who actually just does designs on the, on the drum. So that, those are the two uh, specific instruments that you'll find in the Suleyma. And I guess that's not gonna work either. <laughs> uh, and I don't know if I had a plan B for that one. Let's see. Uh, uh, just wanted you to hear that one, but um, I don't, okay, well, I'll pass. <laughs> but Suleyma has a lot of, uh, lot of drums. I wish I could, uh, maybe this one. So that's not gonna work? No? Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Je voulais qu'ils entendent le, le, I wanted you to hear the music, <laughs> Suleyma. Mezwid is, uh, is the, the, another type of music that's very, um, uh, this one is very popular, and uh, you hear the specificity of the darbuka and the bagpipe. And that one, this one, here, I'll do this. So this is too bad, because you could, I wanted you to also see the, the dancing of, um, of the mezwit. The mezwit is very specific. It's like, And in, the, in this uh, video, you actually saw the, one of the eldest uh, dancers in, of Mezwid and one of the youngest, uh, Roshti, who is very popular now. Um, so <laughs> maybe I can send you that, <laughs> this presentation. Um, next are the women, in, uh, in women singers in Tunisia. And you have Sonia Mbarek, who's one of the most uh, internationally known. She came to DC. Uh, and then in the uh, previous video, you had uh, Esma Othmeni, who played the Mezwid. So you have lots of women. And then Emel Mathluthi, who's, uh, who has sang for Air Spring. Um, hopefully, maybe the, the uh, video will play later. Uh, she's, she's beautiful to watch. Uh, she, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a video so you can at least hear her music. But she's incredible when she, uh, she expresses herself. Um, so next is, um, these are the uh, Azifet, Azif, El Azifet, it's a women only band and they play every instrument and they rep represent every traditional Tunisian songs, uh, beautiful orchestras, they can play anything and everything. And then um, next slide is, is Emel, and Emel, uh, let me see, here's Emel. This is... Um, Actually, this is the song that won a Nobel Prize in 2015 for the Arab Spring. And uh, this song is Kelmti uh, Horra, uh, meaning my word is free. Uh, so just a quick.
So she says it's, uh, you know, uh, and the, what's beautiful about the, her performance too, and she'll, she'll write the words in English so you can see what, she, you can tell what she's saying. Um, then men in, um, in music, uh, you have uh, Hedy Jouini, who's, uh, who was, uh, this is when the French were still in, uh, was, were, um, in Tunisia. So he, uh, he composed, he, st he started teaching at the age of, uh, of uh, he started playing actually at the age of eight, and then um, he, uh, uh, he played every instrument, but especially the oud, and um, Hedi composed a thousand songs. He, he was incredible. Um, let me see if you're okay with, <laughs> with, in terms of time, am I okay? Yeah, no, okay, no more time. All right, I wanted you to hear that. And then uh, uh, Salah Mahdi also. Sabr Rabai is one of the most popular. Then Tafri Yusuf is very uh, new age, uh, very interesting. And then the latest one is Balti. Balti was in New York last uh, uh, three, three weeks ago. Very hip, but also he talks about the freedom and, and just how uh, after the, the revolution, there's still things to, to, to be worked on. But in terms of venues, I wanted to give you a little taste of the amphitheater of Carthage. Uh, it's, it goes back to the, fir the first century. This is the, the, one of the, the sister, let's say it's as the Colosseum in El Gem, which is as nice as the Colosseum in Rome. This one is the uh, Colosseum in Tabarca, so lots of Roman ruins where we have our, our theaters and music, uh, everything is there, it's incredible to see. It brings you back into, into uh, uh, oh, and then I come, <laughs> and then, um, uh, and then there's the, the house, the, Maron, uh, the, Bas, uh, the Maison de Baron d'Erlanger, there's actually pictures, but I guess they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful venue too in Sidi Bou Said, where you, the, the house is incredible. It used to belong to the, the Baron, who also was a doctor in music. And his house is uh, full of, uh, of marble, different types of marbles. And, when, and now today, he, he, um, he gave it to Tunisia. And now today, it's uh, not only the house of, uh, for, for, spec for shows, uh, music shows, but also it's a uh, museum for, for for musical instruments. So normally there's pictures, but <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. Um, uh, yeah, we, we lost all those pictures. And then there's school, then there's the theater. And there was also a school, the picture of the, uh, the theater in Tunis, which is uh, uh, also from the French. Uh, it's Art Deco, I wanted you to see that as a picture. Um, and that was a segue to to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm so lost because my, my slides are not there. Um, there's also, uh, so in terms of theater, uh, it goes back to Roman times. Uh, do you have the, another <laughs> presentation where you have my pictures? <laughs> Maybe not. Okay, that's okay. Uh, Roman times and then the French colonization. The Habib Msika is one of the, uh, the uh, is a, a Jewish uh, um, performer in Tunisia. Um, and today, after the Tunisia's independence, um, these are people, uh, but pictures are gone, so. <laughs> uh, these are people who, who were very important in the Tunisian theater. Um, And I uh, wanted to show you also, before that, there was two comedians who, one of them did come to Tunisia, this one, and this is one comedian that we would like to bring next uh, September uh, to DC through our association called Chakshuka. Her name is Sameh Dashrawi, and she's, she does a one-woman one show about family, and um, uh, it's in Tunisian, so if, uh, <laughs> uh, if you understand Tunisian, then that would be great. But, um, and then um, in terms of going back to venues, I just wanted to show you some of the, the, uh, the theaters in Tunisia. We have, we have only three. Uh, it's a small country. Tunisia remains a small country. But then in each county, there's, there are uh, cultural centers. Uh, so, so Tunisians do, do, pay, do have a lot of, um, uh, do pay attention to their theater. 
uh, in, the, in terms of censorship before the revolution, you couldn't say much. There was, it was always, there was lots of censorship. Some of the comedians would, one of the comedians actually makes fun of the fact that there was always a, a guard or two in the audience. Uh, he could recognize them just by their suit. Uh, and that uh, today he can, today now he can, after the revolution, he can say just about everything. So it's, uh, there is uh, 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 a, um, uh, a great uh, advance in terms of censorship. There's more liberty in Tunisia. Still lots to work on, but it's, uh, it's much better. Thank you, and I'm sorry the, the slides were not complete. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> Désolé. Stay here. No, no, you okay. can stay here. Okay. Um, you know, technology is, uh, sometimes can make problems. <laughs> So we, we should uh, just run with it. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank our speakers, uh, Seiko from the Gambia. Um, stand up, please, Seiko. Seiko from the Gambia. And um, uh, Miriam from Georgia. Uh, and, uh, Joan from the Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Melissa from the Honduras. And uh, Hela from Tunisia. And apologies, Hela, for the uh, no technology issues. And I want to apologize uh, for Miriam because she was up till 2 a.m. preparing a video last night, and uh, we weren't able to um, uh, show it properly. We will send it to you all, I promise. And uh, Jean and Sheila. Sheila, she will conclude the program. Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to say thank you to everybody and everyone for staying. This is this was a launch today. This was our initial time. So you know we're we're still working out the per to perfection. But but I really thought they did a fabulous job. This was not easy. When you have five different speakers representing all these wonderful countries, we just want to give you another hand and thank you. We know the work that was put into getting this ready is not easy. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Each one of you were excellent, really. So what we're going to do, you know we never leave without doing a group photo, right? We want history. Uh, every one of you who are here. So what we'd like to do, and with Sheila, just want to say again, you are the best of the best. What you do here with AAFSW is phenomenal. So I just want to say on behalf of all of us and the Washington Education Cultural Education uh, Organization, we think you're fabulous and you are number one in this city. Sheila Switzer, AAFSW. So with that, if all the speakers will come up, everybody that spoke, and you'll stand in the center. All of you, come, yeah, come, come. 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 Yes, come and Sheila, you right in the center, right in the center. You Monia, I will come. I will. You know, every time I see do playing global enterprises, I have to laugh because my 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 mother said, "Who's who's do playing global enterprises? It's only you." So anyway, I thank you. Every, 